coming up on this week's Files TV. The main principle behind what we're trying to do at Balburnie here is to get more from nature. So all my lifetime we've been brought up to buy the solution in a bag or a can or a bit of technology whereas actually we're finding that nature has many of the answers and that's not good so far as being organic perhaps for us in the short term but certainly being able to get more out of the resources that we have under our feet and the resources that we have in our own minds and just thinking how we can put them to better use to generate a better margin. In central Fife, near Glenrothes, lies Balburnie Home Farms. Balburnie Home Farms is a mixed 1,200 hectare farming enterprise, growing a variety of cereals and vegetable crops, along with an integrated beef and sheep system. David Aglin and the team at Balburnie have applied new measures such as reducing tillage, diversifying rotations and using cover crops to help build soil fertility, boost biodiversity and increase farm resilience whilst reducing their reliance on external inputs. We joined Soil Association Scotland at the end of February on one of their open farm walks to hear more about Balburnie's approach towards farming for both economic and environmental benefit. We've changed how we farm over the last 10 years by way of um, moving the livestock out onto a bigger part of the farm, whereas previously it was very much uh, arable at one end, at the east end, and um, livestock at the west end and we tended to make all the forage in the summer and take it to the cattle for the winter whereas now we tend to grow all the forage in the fields and take the cattle to the forage in the winter. Uh, we've reduced the intensity of our cultivations quite a lot with the introduction of direct drilling and we do practice that as much as we can. We still have some vegetables and root crops in the rotation as well and we've also put grass, a grass lay back into the rotation and diversified the rotation in general with more crops as best we can and cover crops during the winter. Uh, direct drilling's reduced costs for us at Balburnie here quite significantly. Uh, we run half the number of tractors that we used to, so instead of four on the arable side, we have two. Instead of doing 1,700 hours a year between uh, each on all four, we do about 1,200 hours a year on two. The wearing parts and metal has gone down significantly. Our fuel usage has approximately halved over the last 10, 12 years. So that's significant. It's not been without its challenges, but certainly the savings have been there for us on that front. Practical measures we've introduced have been uh, the direct drilling and a bit of min-till when the, when the requirement suits. Mixed species cover crops, some through the summer, but the majority of them grown after harvest uh, for the winter. We're also starting to use that as a forage source for a sheep enterprise we have on the farm now and also for cattle as well in the spring we use some of the cover crops then too. Um, we're also using cover crops as, by way of reducing weed pressure in some crops such as our spring beans and we're trying to mix, mix the species there but also trying to get a bit of diversity into the rest of the rotation within crops as well but that's proving a bit more challenging. We've been trying to rotational graze here for the last seven or eight years and we started off very slowly, literally by moving cattle from one field to another and shutting the gate behind them for a few weeks and then back again. We now ramped that up to daily moves throughout the summer. So we're maximising the rest period that's appropriate for the grass at certain times of the year. So a short rest period in the spring, a long rest period uh, in the, the poor growth stages in the summer and obviously an even longer rest period in the winter. And that's allowing us to grow more grass with little or no artificial fertilizer. Um, and it's, again, it's using the, the, the resources that we have that we're given for nothing. Um, and we're not really seeing a massive reduction output. What we are seeing is a big reduction in the costs that we're using to produce meat here. The biggest challenge we find is, is, is the change in mindset required to adopt a, a different type of system. Um, and I, wouldn't, I would go so far as to say that Farmers are human beings. This is not a problem that's peculiar to farmers ourselves. It's a, it's a human problem. We're all, we all get in our comfort zone. I'm no exception. Um, and yeah, the, 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 there's a, a saying I've heard somebody suggested that the biggest source of compaction is, is in between the ears when it comes to change. And um, that's been a challenge. Some people can adapt quickly. Some people don't. 
and varying reasons and and i'm not i'm not no person to judge whether anybody's right or wrong you've all got your own reasons for doing what you wish to do um, and if it comes down to enjoyment then that that's a good enough reason it suited us to do what we've done here and i've been fortunate enough to to have the opportunity to make the changes and to develop my own mind in doing it so yes it's it's a challenge but um, it's not compulsory I think by and large the group this morning it was apparent that people are looking for solutions that, that there's a real head of steam picking up now farmers wanting to change they they know the economics aren't as good as they were within the industry and they're not likely to go back to what we've had in the past so we we, we need to change it's the finding the answers finding the solutions um, and people seemed interested to see what we've done here at Balburnie um, and also interested in the fact that you need to admit your mistakes too. We, we've made a lot of changes here, but we've made some horrendous errors too over the years. And we just learn from them. I, I don't think we learn much doing the job right all the time. If you make mistakes, you're going to learn from it, and that's progress. Points that I've learned over the last few years and the changes we've made here are, number one, speak to people speak to your peers, find people who are trying things, willing to try things, even those that don't know what to try, speak to people. That's, that's been a big source of information, just friends and peers out and about. We talk a lot, we're always comparing notes, and, and that's, that's been hugely influential and, and encouraging too, because as I say, there's lots of people looking to try and find solutions. Secondly, just try stuff. You know, see what you can afford to try. It might just be a quarter of an acre in the corner of a field, but try it. It might work, it might not work, but try something. And thirdly, get a handle on the state of your soil now. Use a spade, go and have a dig around. Don't get too fussed about counting worms or getting too technical. Just, just get a rough feel for the soil. Does it feel nice? Is there erosion problems? Um, does it feel nice to walk on? Does it smell nice? Does it look nice? and then just take that progress year on year and you'll soon judge whether you're making improvements or, or, um, or not, or things are staying static. But yeah, get a feel for what you've got now. Integrating livestock within the arable enterprises at Balburnie plays a big part in benefiting the whole farming system. Alex and Rosie are new entrant farmers who moved to Scotland in August last year to contract manage the beef herd for Balburnie home farms. The couple also run their own sheep on the farm, bringing a multitude of benefits to soil health and arable crop yields. My name's Rosie. Um, I'm originally from just outside of Leeds. Um, I was going to be a vegetarian dog and cat vet and then I decided to be a farmer instead. And I've sort of worked, um, shepherded all over the country, worked for um, a agri-tech company, Hectare. Um, that's the parent company that sells my livestock and I decided I wanted to be back in full-time farming um, and keep running my sheepdogs. So we started f farming full-time together and um, that was down in Lincolnshire and uh, we've recently moved up to um, Fife uh, here at Balburnie um, to contract manage the cattle herd. I used to help on my neighbour's sheep and beef farm as a school child and then I joined the army straight from school, then spent some time in haulage and I started contracting in Gloucestershire and like Rosie of Shepherd did all over the country. We started our sheep flock together in Lincolnshire, like she says, and we moved up here in August. So Balburnie have been looking for cattlemen for a while. They've, they've had quite a churn of staff and they were wanting somebody that more aligned with their vision for the um, grazing style that they wanted and their soil health aims and a low input outdoor herd. And that aligns very closely with what we want to do with our sheep and we were able to offer that to them. So we've got a, a contract agreement with them and we get a, a monthly management fee and a house and we provide the labour for the cattle enterprise and then as part of that package we get to graze our sheep across the estate in alignment with their soil health and arable needs. And for a headage fee. For a weekly headage fee, yeah. All the combinables this year are getting grazed by sheep. At the start of the season, David and I, the farm manager, sat down and did a feed budget and identified that we had extra feed. So we brought in 500 tack animals, which are stall lambs that we're grazing to finish. And they're on a, a seven hectare block and there's 750 head there. They'll be there for 72 hours and then they'll move on again. The idea is that that'll reduce arable inputs in that they don't need herbicide 
or fungicide or growth regulator and the tillering from the grazing action should give an extra quarter to half tonne an acre. The benefits for the sheep are we get clean grazing and a high ME feed. We should improve soil organic matter and soil structure through trampling in of organic matter and the recycling of nutrients through the sheep manure. It's all about high animal impact, which is high stocking density, so large amounts of animals on a small area moved very frequently. We don't want stock to take a second bite of that plant when it's growing because that'll penalise further growth. We've got somebody in Bedfordshire that we bought sheep from and, and he's fully integrated his sheep into his arable and that's where I get the figure of a, a bonus half to a quarter tonne an acre of cereal yield from grazed cereal crops. But I mean it's nothing new, you know the Romans grazed their wheat with sheep? If they knew it 2,000 years ago, we should do it now. I think if we've learned anything in agriculture, it's you've got to, you can't be trying to convince people about what you're wanting to do. Like, you've either got to, you've got to work with people who are like-minded and who are already bought in, and you just deliver that. Like, we are sort of, our, very much our philosophy at the moment, isn't it? It's, you've got to um, play to your own strengths and like, if you're good at arable farming, like you stick to that and, and get us a, um, a third party livestock um, grazier in who's going to implement what you want and stay hands off um, with that and let them get on with it and trust that they're good at what they do. Um, I think that's our <laughs> takeaway from yeah. the last few years, put it that way. I'd agree with that, definitely. Based on their experiences at Balburnie, Alex and Rosie have useful advice for other farmers and crofters across Scotland and have clear plans for their own farming future. You've got to think about what you want to achieve, first of all. Yeah, you've got to have a goal, basically. And, and, and then you've got to work with the right people to achieve that goal. Yeah. And then you've got to let the specialists do their thing, but keep in touch with them, you know. It's a collaboration. A yeah, it yeah. is. And that's what we what that's we like what we've about. That's what we got here at Balburnie. Yeah, it's very much a collaboration. We all feed off each other. Um, we all understand that we've all got businesses to run, and you know we all want to make money, and we all have the same aims, and that's really refreshing for us. Um, and I think if you can go in there with honesty and and you know talk collaboratively about what you want to achieve together, and that's you know in the short term and the long term, I think that's where, you know that's that's where we're getting at here, isn't it? We're, yeah. We're we're really. So far, we're really happy here. You know, what we're delivering to Balburnie is the, the specialist labour and also the sheep. Balburnie haven't had to lay out any finance for the sheep or the equipment. We've provided all of that. And in return, we're grazing the cops the way they want. And we've got secure access to ground. Which has been, been our so biggest barrier yeah. today. Is having the, the security. Yeah, and that's why we moved up here in yeah. August, because we had a five year agreement. We've got secure access to ground. We're really quite disciplined on sort of short, medium and long term goals. Yeah. Short term, we've got to have a successful calving this year and a successful lambing. Calving starts in 10 days, lambing starts in five weeks. And then we have a successful breeding for the cattle, which will be in July. Really exciting because we'll be AIing the heifers to maximise genetic gain and using the new bulls on the rest of the cow herd. Medium term, we've got a five year agreement here at Balburnie. We want to have a herd that has good synergy with the rest of the estate and is very productive and profitable. We'll be fully outdoor calving from 2024. So the idea is that these beef animals won't ever again see the inside of a shed. And we aim to push our sheep numbers to 2000 ewes. Mm. And then our eventual long term goal is farm ownership, be it in the UK or overseas somewhere. So it's all about building wealth and equity. And this is the great thing about this Balburnie opportunity. We are able to generate wealth in excess of our earned wage. It's not just a job to us. So we're going to go that extra mile to make sure it's all successful. Dr Audrey Litterick is a crops and soil scientist with around 30 years experience working with farmers and crofters to help improve their soil health, crop management and reduce inputs. When I started 30 years ago, not very many mainstream farmers were all that interested in what I was trying to say. Whereas now, I just cannot keep up with the work and uh, the, the level of interest is just absolutely phenomenal. Um, many, many farmers now are focused on reducing inputs 
on improving soil health and and uh, looking to to spend less money on on fertilizers and and synthetic pesticides so there's there's and i'm seeing i'm seeing a real passion amongst farmers now for the kind of things that have interested me for such a long time this morning as we started to uh, we put spades into the ground and and for any farmer who's wanting to start out on a regenerative fer um, a regenerative journey the most important thing that he can possibly uh, have is a simple spade and that's how we started the morning so we we dug into the ground and i just could not help but smile i've never seen an arable field in in uh, in better heart than what we saw this morning we must have been looking at 40 plus earthworms in a spit of soil and that was um, a beautifully structured topsoil. Its soil smelt amazing, it looked amazing, it was a, a nice dark colour so there was a reasonable amount of organic matter in it but it was the soil life that was just phenomenal. Um, lots of vertical channels, soft aggregates, um, just amazing. Grazing livestock on cereal crops brings many benefits to soil structure, soil health and improving crop yields. I've been long an advocate of this, um, probably because I've worked with organic farmers for quite some time. Um, and organic farmers, um, I wouldn't say they always have to have livestock, but that's, that's the general way it works. More organic farmers probably that are growing arable crops do also have livestock. It works. It clearly works. Um, it helps with natural nutrient cycling, especially when you're actually grazing some of the crops. And this is still a bit of a taboo subject um, amongst some uh, perhaps more traditional arable farmers that don't have livestock. The, the shock, the thought that their, their uh, lovely um, autumn sown wheat crops might be, might be grazed by, by um, a mob of livestock is pretty horrific. But when it's done in the right way, it can work really, really well. You can... It, the key is in getting the animals on um, short and sharp, if you like, grazing off the tops, and it stimulates the roots to, to get down there and, and uh, explore the soil, and the plants recover incredibly quickly. But you've also got this, um, a sprinkling, not much more than that, of fresh dung across the soil surface. And uh, one of the keys, I believe, to regenerative farming is lots of repeated uh, small amounts of fresh organic matter being added to the soil rather than one great big dump every three years say in, in, in a field receiving um, some dung or say some compost where you've got animals on the grass um, short and sharp perhaps more than once a year even on arable land you've got those, those, those uh, returns of organic matter and, and that can be a bit of a miracle worker really in, in helping to stimulate soil microbial activity. What we need to focus on more and more is the life that's beneath the soil. And I don't mean just the stuff that you can see. Um, it's also the stuff that you can't see. And we're not yet at the stage of fully understanding how to manipulate the soil microbiome, if you like, or the, the microorganisms in the soil. We don't yet know how best to enhance that and manipulate it to, to best effect, but we're learning all the time. And fresh additions of organic matter is, I'm absolutely certain of the benefits of that, regular additions. What are the key things farmers and crofters should consider for their land? It depends on your soil type, um, because and, and one of the challenges in Scotland is that we have so many different soil types, um, and we have so many different altitudes and aspects as well. So every farm is to a certain extent different, but in broad terms, uh, for for me with a silty soil, probably the most important thing is make sure your soil has a living cover at all times. Silty soils are very easily damaged by raindrop impact, for example, and you can do some terrible damage to your soil simply by leaving it bare. So trying to have ideally a living soil cover at all time and at the very least um, leaving crop residues on the surface to try and protect the soil surface over winter, um, that's, that's one thing. Regular fresh additions of organic matter I would say would be another one and that can be, those, those little regular additions might be um, animals grazing for one or two grazing periods a year and maybe also making sure that your crop residues are returned to the soil rather than being taken off and it's a very difficult balance if you're trying to make money from selling straw. 
but perhaps it's an idea that you would be returning the straw to the land in some fields some of the time as chopped straw um, and crop residues and sometimes even just um, chopped up weeds. It can be several different types of organic matter that you're adding and the, the, the more diversity the better, which leads me on to my third point probably, and that is increased diversity of the above ground things that's on your soil to the greatest extent that you can. And by that mainly I mean um, grow as many different types of crops as you can and use cover crops where you possibly can. Um, if at all possible, um, use cover crops uh, after every single crop that's harvested. So, so keeping the, a living cover in the soil over the winter. I know it's difficult in Scotland. It's, it's harder the further north that you are basically to get well-established cover crops growing uh, it, uh, far north. But it's possible after some crops and it's possible in the good seasons to get a really fantastic cover crop. So, and the more, I wouldn't say necessarily multi 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 species cover crops we, we heard this morning about 15 species in a cover crops mix that can be very expensive but i would say aim for at least five in your in your cover crops and and have diversity in other ways where you can as well there's a strong case for having more than one different type of livestock for example uh, sheep and cattle and maybe something else as well so sheep and cattle diversity that's my third point really, in both particularly crops, including cover crops, but potentially also livestock as well. Farm walks like this one at Balburnie provide great opportunities for farmers and crofters to learn from each other, see alternative approaches and find out about new developments in the sector. This farm walk is part of a wider programme of activities and resources being offered by Soil Association Scotland. If you would like more information on soil health and soil management, please visit the Soil Association Scotland webpage. Hello, I'm Tiffany McTaggart bringing you this week's Rural Roundup. The weather has definitely gone downhill since last time I spoke to you. Um, we put the soil thermometer into the ground um, about three weeks ago and we found that um, the temperature was starting to creep up. Two weeks ago we found that we'd reached seven degrees and having had another cold snap of weather and some snow coming, we found that the soil's back down to five degrees now. So it's definitely noticeable that the crops are not growing and the grass is definitely stalled. Um, so hopefully we'll get some more warm weather again soon to get everything motoring on. Most of you should have heard by now that the Sustainable Agricultural Capital Grant Scheme deadline has been extended. It has been extended until the 31st of March. You have to make sure that you have bought and paid for your items before this time. The items need to have been received onto farm, be fitted and fully operational for you to be able to make your claim. You also have to take geotagged photographs of the items operational to prove that they are on your farm. If you said you were going to get a carbon audit and or a nutrient management plan as part of the Sustainable Agricultural Capital Grant Scheme, make sure these are completed before you make your claim. The Agri-Environmental Climate Scheme application window is open. If you're looking to apply for slurry storage, this deadline is the 24th of March. This is much quicker. All the other options are through until the 7th of June, but for the slurry storage, you've got till the 24th of March. So don't miss the deadline for this. Available on the Rural Payments and Services website, there is a new slurry storage um, and production calculator. So you can work out how much slurry you're producing on your farm more easily and work out what storage requirements you might have. Um, it's not compulsory to use this new tool, but it's definitely highly recommended as it should hopefully make you putting together your figures and putting together your application more easy. So make sure you don't miss out on this deadline. Thoughts are turning to the single application form. The application window is now open and you have through until midnight on the 15th of May to complete your application and provide all the supporting paperwork and documents as well. If you're looking at um, transferring entitlements, the deadline for this is the 2nd of April. So this is whether you're buying or selling entitlements, you need to think about getting those applications done now. If you've made any changes to the land, for example, you've merged two fields together, you've put in a new fence line to split some fields, or you've put up a new shed in the corner of a field, 
you have until the 16th of April to be putting in a land maintenance form. Any land maintenance forms put in before the 16th of April, they will be dealt with very quickly. So if you've got a single application form, which has been in drafts or has been submitted, you'll have to go back and revisit this and make updates to it to take into account these changes. If you go and submit a land maintenance form after the 16th of April, these will not be processed before the 15th of May. Um, so you will not have to make a change on your single application forms for these changes. But you do have until the 31st of May to make any changes required to take into account the land maintenance form which you have submitted. For your land maintenance forms, you can submit this on the new online mapping system on rural payments, the Lippis Map Viewer. And this is a very quick and easy way to submit your form. Alternatively, you can use the traditional document which you could fill in and either post or email across to your local ARPID office. Make sure you also have a think about your ecological focus areas if you're needing greening. The earlier you think about this, the better. Make sure that you have plenty of EFA available for when you put your application in. Make sure you have your maps ready and documents to get submitted with your application form as well. There is a new option for EFA areas this year. So the new option is agroforestry. To be eligible for the agroforestry option, you needed to have planted trees under the small farm woodland option for the forestry grant scheme. If you've planted trees under a different forestry grant scheme option, or if you've planted trees without funding, you will not be eligible to claim this as EFA areas for agroforestry. Make sure you get all your documents in and submit your single application form by the 15th of May. That's all for me this week and hopefully next time I see you it'll be better weather and more cheery. <laughs>